Okay, let us begin with a word of prayer. Our loving Heavenly Father, we give thanks that we can again meet on your Holy Sabbath day to study your word and to, on this occasion, look in the history of the events which have affected this year earth so negatively to the history of the fall of Satan. And we give thanks for the spirit of prophecy that has given us insights beyond what the Bible says. And we just give thanks that uh, we have the ability to share these things with the technology. This is your time. And I pray that those who have been watching this year study can have a deeper understanding of that controversy and of uh, your character involved within it. And that uh, we know that you have an answer and that uh, we pray that uh, we can have a deeper appreciation for what you've done for us and to be obedient to all your commandments and to trust you with our lives. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, so this is uh, the beginning of the great controversy according to Ellen White. Uh, this is just a study uh, that I is resulting from a, a study of Ezekiel chapter 28 that I done with the group, mostly from ones from the UK. And after I done it, is we look at Ezekiel chapter 28. I wanted to sort of go and have a deeper understanding. Now I know that Ellen White, her quotes are really you find maybe a lot of this here in the story of redemption. You might find a lot of that here, but I, I can't really remember. I don't think I've really got into that compilation. I just sort of done my own. Uh, so I, I, I don't know if there's a, maybe something there that I missed that could have been contributed to this or not. I just tried to find all I could within the CD-ROM uh, on this here topic. No, I didn't have access to the unpublished writings. Uh, I think I remember Dwight mentioned that on Friday evening. He mentioned something there in the unpublished writings about Lucifer and Ezekiel 28. I think he's gonna, he mentioned he'd send that to me. I haven't received it yet. <laughs> so, so that could really just be added to this year's study. And that's why I was interested in what he said there because it kind of um, was something new I could maybe add to this. So, um, so this compilation of writing seeks to set forth the narrative of the events preceding the beginning of this earth and their impact after the earth was created on the pair from whom we draw our lineage, namely Adam and Eve. Uh, so quoting Ezekiel chapter 28 says, Thy art the anointed cherub that covereth, I have set thee so Thou was upon the holy mountain of God. Thou has walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Now, I'll maybe read a few passages, but maybe I'd be happy if uh, Theodore or, or maybe some other people wanted to read some um, paragraphs. That would be very much appreciated, rather than listening just to me, my voice all the time. So the first... Uh, Paragraph uh, relates to the, the happy state of Lucifer. So Lucifer, son of the morning, was the first of the covering cher cherubs. My first there I, I take to be in, in sort of a status rather than being the first, maybe he could be the first cherub ever created, but, but first in, in rank anyway, holy and undefiled. He stood in the presence of the great creator and the ceaseless beams of glory enshrouded the eternal God rested upon him. He had been highest of all the created beings and had been foremost in revealing God's purposes to the universe. Distinguished by excellence, God made him good and beautiful, as near as possible like himself, a high and exalted angel, next in order to God's dear son. His countenance, like those of other of the other angels, was mild and expressive of happiness. 
His forehead was high and broad, showing a powerful intellect. His form was perfect, his bearing noble and majestic. A special light beamed in his countenance and shone round about him, brighter and more beautiful than any than and than around, sorry, brighter and more beautiful than around the other angels. He was greatly loved by the heavenly beings, and his influence over them was strong. So, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, maybe someone can read this paragraph here. I can do that. The angels had been created full of goodness and love. They loved one another impartially and their God supremely. And they were prompted by his love to do his pleasure. The law of God was not a grievous yoke to them, but it was their delight to do his commandments, to hearken unto the voice of his word. Peace and joy in perfect submission to the will of heaven existed throughout the angelic host. Love to God was supreme. Love for one another, impartial. Such was the condition that existed for ages. Which is interesting that it's, it existed for ages, so it's quite a long time, I would think. Yes. Uh, Lucifer had experienced the pure contentment, the peace, the exalted happiness, and unalloyed joys of the heavenly abode. He had realized the satisfaction of the full approval of God. He had a full appreciation of the glory that enshrouded the Father and knew that there was no limit to his power. It was his joy to execute the divine commands. His heart was filled with love and joy in serving his creator. Thou was perfect in thy ways from the day that thou was created till iniquity was found in thee. Uh, the potential of sin. Though God had created Lucifer noble and beautiful and had exalted him to high honour among the angelic host, yet he had not placed him beyond the possibility of evil. It was in Lucifer's power did he so did he choose to do so to pervert these gifts. The beginning of sin. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by the reason of thy brightness. The father consulted his son in regard to the formation of man. They purposed to make this world and create beasts and living things upon it, and to make man in the image of God, to reign as a ruling monarch over every living thing which God should create. When Lucifer learned the purpose of God, he was envious of, at Christ, and jealous because the Father had not consulted him in regard to the creation of man. The envy and jealousy of Satan increased. He desired to receive the highest honours in heaven next to God. Little by little, Lucifer came to indulge the desire for self-exaltation. Though all his glory was from God, this angel came to regard it as pertaining to himself. He began to think that his wisdom was not derived from God, but was inherent in himself, and that he was worthy as, God, as was God to receive honour and power. Not content with his position, though honoured above the heavenly host, he ventured to covet homage due alone to the Creator. Instead of seeking to make God supreme in the affections and allegiance of all created beings, it was his endeavour to secure their service and loyalty to himself, and coveting the glory with which the infinite father, father had invested in his son, had invested his son, this prince of angels aspired to power and gradually assumed the a command, that which was the prerogative of Christ alone. Okay, uh, just a couple of questions here. So going back to that ages, so that means prior to the creation of this earth, there were ages that this condition where there's peace and harmony and all these things existed for ages. So an age is a pretty long time. So we don't know how long that is, but it's a long time. So that means um, the idea that, you know, everything, including the angels and all that, were created 6,000 and 
whatever it is, 60 years ago, um, would be wrong, right? According to the spirit of prophecy that we know that, that the universe and the angels were created before the earth was created, right? And a long time before. Yes, and there was other worlds as well. Yes. So, so now what's going to happen according to this is God is going to choose to make this earth. And it, and it appears from this that that is the thing that elicits the first envy in Lucifer. Yes. So, so, I mean, obviously this, it must have been growing to some degree just his, his self dependence. But now that he's not consulted, all of a sudden he's rebuffed, which there's no reason for him to be, but, but he is. So, um, so I had always thought that there was a statement in the spirit of prophecy that, that this rebellion had already happened. Well, not the full out rebellion, but that part of what God was doing in creating in man was actually meant to help, help Lucifer. Right. So, I mean, now here it says that, of course, he becomes envious. Um, so it could be that, you know, this is the seed is already there in Lucifer and God is doing this to to help him. But the result is the opposite. It is it exposes to Lucifer something within himself, which if he would have recognized God could have helped him with. But instead, he's going to hide it. Is is that a fair conclusion from what we've read? Um, it's not explicit, but uh, mm-hmm. you could read that into it. The, the quote there is a quote that sort of um, the Ellen White says that that mankind was made to replace the angels. And I'm thinking that you can maybe get from the idea from that there that this rebellion ha- happened first and then God's decided then to create man and the earth and so forth. Well, it could be God also had awesome. foresight, but, um, but and, and that could be part of the jealousy that Satan has. Because God is now doing, in my understanding, the creation of man is something special. That is, the angels themselves cannot reproduce. And and my understanding is that man is the first creature that has that ability, um, sentient being that has that ability to do so. So the angels themselves don't reproduce. But now God is doing this special work of creation. Um, and it could be in anticipation of what's what's. Uh, going to happen and yet you know we so so he may know that he's going to have to replace these angels with with man but it it's not clear right it, that's what i'm saying is there's two that don't seem to fit together when we just look at them on if we just take them in one way or the other right so so there's something interesting here going on anyway sorry about that interruption okay um Maybe someone else could read this uh, paragraph. Any volunteers? I think let me read. It yeah, says, Now the perfect harmony of heaven was broken. Lucifer's disposition to serve his, himself instead of his creator aroused a feeling of ap- apprehension when observed by those who considered th- that the grace of God should be supreme. In, in heavenly council, the angels pleaded with Lucifer, the Son of God, presented before him the greatness and the, the goodness and the justice of the Creator and the sacred, unchanging nature of his law. God himself had established the order of heaven, and in departing from it, Lucifer could dishonor his Maker and bring ruin upon himself. But the warning given in infinite love and mercy only arose a spirit of resistance. Lucifer allowed his jealousy of Christ to prevail and became 
the more deta- and became the more determined the dispute the dispute sorry to dispute the supremacy of the son of god thus impeaching the wisdom and love of the creator had become the purpose of his prince of this prince of angels to this object he was about to bend the energies of his creator to to this object he was about to bend the energy the energies of the of of that mastermind which next to Christ was the first among the hosts of God but he who have the will of all his creatures free left none unguarded to be bewildering to be bewildering sophistry by which rebellion could seek to justify so before the great contest should open or were to have a clear presentation of his will whose wisdom and goodness were the spring of all their joy okay thank you is it uh, samuel thank you um, so there is a great assembly before the throne of god uh, the great creator assembled the heavenly hosts that he might in the presence of the uh, in the presence of all the angels confer special honor upon his son the son of god shared the father's throne and the glory of the eternal self-existent one encircled both about the throne gathered the holy angels a vast unnumbered throng 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands the most exalted angels as ministers and subjects rejoicing in the light that fell upon them from the presence of the deity the father then made known that it was ordained by himself that Christ, the only begotten of God, his son would be equal with himself. So that where, wherever was the presence of his son, it was as his own presence. The word of the son was to be obeyed as readily as the word of the father. His son had invested, sorry, his son he had invested with authority to command the heavenly host, especially was his son to work in union with himself in the anticipated creation of the earth and everything and every living thing that should exist upon the earth. His son would carry out his will and his purposes, but would do nothing of himself alone. The father's will would be fulfilled in him. He would not seek uh, he would not seek power or exaltation for himself contrary to God's plan. So this seems this year assembly seems to be um, just to sort of clarify things with this year what's been going on with uh, Lucifer. Um, this year jealousy that he's mm-hmm. beginning to incite this rebellion. This is God now has this assembly to try to clarify things. Um, yeah, so, angels, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So um so what we're gathering from this is uh, God makes plans and, and Satan knows about these plans, but he's not included. And this, this brings forth this jealousy. But this is still before man is created. Man isn't just created the, right away, right? There's just these plans. Mm-hmm. In that time, then this rebellion sort of foments. And then God knows that there's going to be this conflict and he lays down uh, um, so uh, what was it here um, so he just lays down basically uh, the principles of his kingdom uh, and this is to, to help them right so they all have a clear presentation of his will right that's the idea and then it says the father then made known that it was ordained by himself that Christ the only begotten son of God should be equal with himself so that wherever was the presence of the son, it was his own presence. So this wouldn't have been known prior to this, right? Probably not, no. Right. So, so Christ is acting all this time as a servant, you know, in, in a sense. Mm-hmm. He's acting as a servant, but now it's really being revealed that he's the only begotten son of God. And, and that he's, he's really the, 
the one who can command the heavenly host. So, so this is something that's not generally well understood in Adventism. Even though it's in Story of Redemption, I know this is in Story of Redemption. Yeah, so uh, just another paragraph before that. Yeah. It's sort of like it's being agitated. So before there, it says there, before the great contest should open, all were to have like a clear presentation. Mm -hmm. So this is kind of this assembly then. Yeah. Just to sort of to clarify that, make it clear yeah. what side people have. are going to be on. Yeah. Okay. And that should have helped Lucifer understand that, that this was indeed the son of God that he was jealous about. It wasn't just, you know, another angel. Mm -hmm. Maybe you could read the next paragraph, please. The angels joyfully acknowledged the supremacy of Christ and prostrating themselves before him, poured out their love and adoration. Lucifer bowed with them. But in his heart, there was a strange, fierce conflict. Truth, justice, and loyalty were struggling against envy and jealousy. The influence of the holy angels seemed for a time to carry him with them as songs of praise ascended in melodious strains, swelled by thousands of glad voices. The spirit of evil seemed vanquished. Unutterable love thrilled his entire being. His soul went out in harmony with the sinless worshipers, in love to the Father and the Son. But again, he was filled with pride in his own glory. His desire for supremacy returned, and envy of Christ was once more indulged. The high honors conferred upon Lucifer were not appreciated as God's special gift, and therefore called forth no gratitude to his creator. He gloried in his brightness and exaltation and aspired to be equal with God. He was beloved and reverenced by the heavenly host. Angels delighted to execute his commands, and he was clothed with wisdom and glory above them all. The Son of God was exalted above him as one in power and authority with the Father. He shared the Father's counsel, while Lucifer did not thus enter into the purposes of God. Why? questioned this mighty angel. Should Christ have the supremacy? Why is he honored above Lucifer? Were not his garments light and beautiful? Thank you. So uh, he did seem to, he got a, a sense of that love again, but then rejected it. Um, so Lucifer assembles angels, leaving his place in the immediate presence of the Father. Lucifer went forth dissatisfied, and filled with envy against Jesus Christ to diffuse the spirit of discontent among the angels. He worked with mysterious secrecy and for a time concealed his real purpose under an appearance of reverence for God. He assembled the angelic host. He began to insinuate doubts concerning the laws that govern heavenly beings, intimating that though laws might be necessary, for the inhabitants of the worlds. So you have that other worlds existing at that their time. Mm -hmm. Angels being more exalted needed no such restraint for their own wisdom was, was a sufficient guide. They were not beings that could bring dishonor to God. All their thoughts were holy. It was no more possible for them than for God himself to err. The exaltation of the sun of God as equal with the Father was represented as an injustice to Lucifer, who, it was claimed, was also entitled to reverence and honour. If this prince of angels could but attain to his true exalted position, great good would accrue to the entire host of heaven, for it was his ob object to secure freedom for all. But now, even the liberty which they had hitherto enjoyed was at an end, for an absolute ruler had been appointed them, and to his authority all must pay homage and yield servile honour. Um, so sorry to interrupt here, but um, so I just noticed something that's obvious that I never noticed before. So when we think about what's going on in the heart of Lucifer, so this, this feeling of envy and jealousy is not a pleasant feeling, right? Mm -hmm. 
And instead of attributing that to himself, he's actually seeing Jesus as the reason that he feels miserable. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. So this, this does explain human nature. This does explain why people lash out at those that they're jealous of. It's, it's not so much, I mean, obviously they, they, they're jealous. They want that person's place and position, but they want to hurt them, right? As if that person is the cause of their problem. If I could just get rid of that person, if I could just tear down their character, if they could just fail and other people could see that I'm better than they are, that I should be in this position. Um, so that's why there's so much the ire of the dragon, right? There's so much hatred toward those that they're envious of. I mean, so it's, it's probably, everybody has probably already noticed this, but it's not something I've thought of before. Um, and, and I, and I think it's probably should be obvious, but, um, well, there was another thought there too, but anyway, that's the main thought I had from that. Right. But yeah, the exaltation of the son of God is equal with the father was represented as an injustice to Lucifer. Right. So, so I, I guess the other thought just, Oh, that's the other thought is having to do with what we've been studying of regarding 1888. And of course, in the time of Christ. So in 1888, we had really clear representation of this manifestation where you got Jones and Wagner presenting a message. And the leadership saying, well, you know, we should be the source of of new light. Why are these these young ministers the ones that God has chosen to give a special message? Right. And that explains the anger. And the same also with this movement, the light that's been given to it and the church's reaction to that. uh, What we studied last night. So so this is just a universal principle. That when we have hatred towards another, it, it's unjustified. And, and we should recognize that in ourselves. When we feel this feeling, instead of thinking the other person is the cause, we need to recognize what it is in us that causes us to feel this way. Yes, it's just not content with the position that God has given us and letting God exalt us. But we're wanting to, in a sense, exalt ourselves. And then you have peace, right? When you, when you, something that you have no control over, when you leave things in God's hands, you can have peace, right? When, when you're, you're trying to control things and you want things to be your way, uh, you don't have any peace. And it's not the person that's not listening to you or whatever that's the problem. The problem really lies with inside of you if you don't have peace. Uh, does someone else have a comment or would like to read the next paragraph? If not, this one. Let me read. Yeah, go ahead. He stated to them that he had called them together to assure them that he no longer would submit to his invasion of his rights and theirs, that never could he again bow down to Christ, that he would take the honor upon himself which, which should have been conferred upon him and would be the commander of all who could submit to, to follow him and obey his voice. There was contention among the angels. Lucifer cunningly drew his hearers to give utterance to, the, to their feelings. Then these expressions were repeated by him when it would serve his purpose as evidence that the angels were not fully in harmony with the government of God. While claiming for his while claiming for himself perfect royalty to God, he had that he, he had that changes in the order and laws of heaven were necessary for the sust- for the stability of the divine government. Thus while working to excite opposition to the law of God and to instill his own discontent 
into the minds of the angels up under under him, he was ostensibly seeking to, re, to remove dissatisfaction and to reconcile disaffected angels to the order of heaven, while secretly fomenting while secretly fomenting this discord and rebellion, he would he will consummate craft caused it to appear as his sole purpose to promote reality and to preserve harmony and peace. Okay, uh, thank you, Samuel. Um, yeah, something about that doesn't really flow grammatically. I just thought maybe I have to check that if something's changed there. Yeah, sometimes it's just... Um... When they create the document, they, there's some typos show up just from the, uh, the way they scan the text. Um, but with consummate craft caused it to appear. He with consummate craft. Now that's, that should be fine. Well, secretly fomenting discord and rebellion, he with consummate craft caused it to appear as his sole purpose to promote loyalty and to preserve harmony and peace. That's okay. Yeah, that's all right. Okay, thanks. <laughs> So I keep interrupting here all the time, but, but so one of the things that's interesting about this, so you have these angels in heaven and, and, you know, they're happy, but Lucifer is going to come in and this envy that he has, he's going to infect the angels with that. And one third of the angels are going to fall, Right. I mean, to me, that's very, very remarkable that this happens. So what he does is he he puts this seed of discontent into them, the same seed that's in himself. And then just like him, they think the problem with their discontent is is what is this injustice. Instead of recognizing the problem, the reason why they're discontented is their their own characters, right? Their their envy is is the problem, not not the thing they're envious of. Yes. So the next paragraph, the spirit of dissatisfaction thus kindled was doing its baleful work. While there was no open outbreak, division of feeling imperceptibly grew among grew up among the angels. There was some who looked with favour upon the Sufferer's insinuations against the government of God. Although they had hitherto for been in perfect harmony with the order which God had established, they were now discontented and unhappy because they could not penetrate his unsearchable counsels. They were dissatisfied with his purpose in exalting Christ. These stood ready to second Lucifer's demand for equal authority with the Son of God. So you have now two points that are now present. That uh, you have this exaltation of Christ that they're not happy with. And that, uh, that they themselves cannot penetrate God's unsearchable counsel. So God and the Son had met, went into this year council uh, to discuss the creation. And it's kind of as if God's now keeping things. They were happy enough before that, but now Lucifer's pointing out, look, God's keeping things from us. He's, uh, we need to be involved here in finding out what God's doing instead of uh, trusting him. Mm-hmm. Uh, just uh, another sort of Point that seems to stand out for me is uh, if God and the Son were in this year council, where was the Holy Spirit if He was the third person of the Godhead? The story okay. doesn't seem to evolve. You, so you're trying to open up a can of worms here? Well, we can just leave out and discuss another time. But it's just well, the only I can say is that that Christ is the only one. Uh, Ellen White says that could enter into the councils uh, with the Father, right? Mm-hmm. So the Holy Spirit, in in that sense, in this history, is excluded as well. 
So, you know, the question is, as you're asking, is what does that mean? And now one way that that's been solved, and this is actually Jeff's position, because we had this discussion back in 2017, in February of 2017, when I was at Eatonville, because there was a guy there who was an anti-Trinitarian who was trying to get heard by Jeff. And so we had this discussion regarding it. And the idea is that the Holy Spirit itself is the spirit of the father and the spirit of the son. And that, that, you know, it doesn't, it, it's not the same type of manifestation that's needed. That is, it's something that exists between the father and the son. And so it is a person, but it, it's not, it, it's, it's not a person in, in the same way that the father and the son are persons. And at this time, we don't see that, that the Holy Spirit is separate, right? So we don't see it as a separate person. But when Christ takes upon humanity, then the Holy Spirit is then given as this separate person. Because uh, the word that's used is that Christ divests himself. Uh, are people familiar with that quote? Sounds familiar, yes. Right. So, um, so the Holy Spirit is is Christ divested of humanity. I'm just going to try to find the, uh, yeah. So, uh, says this is from, uh, 14 manuscript releases page 23. Cumbered with humanity, Christ could not be in every place personally. So he could have before that. Yes. Therefore, it was altogether for their advantage that he should leave them go to his father and send the Holy Spirit to be his successor on earth. The Holy Spirit is himself divested of the personality of humanity and independent thereof. He would represent himself as present in all places by his Holy Spirit as the omnipresent. So the Holy Spirit is himself, that is Christ, divested of the personality of humanity. And and he would represent himself, that is, Christ would represent himself as present in all places by his Holy Spirit as the omnipresent. Um, and Ellen White says in another statement, 14 manuscript releases, page 179. It is not a sense. What's that? Uh, Let, me... Let me read this other statement first, OK, because this is related. Uh, it is not essential for you to know and to be able to define just what the Holy Spirit is. Christ tells us that the Holy Spirit is the Comforter, and the Comforter is the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of Truth, which the Father shall send in my name. I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another Comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of Truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not. Neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, And shall be in you. This refers to the omnipresence of the spirit of Christ called the comforter. Again, Jesus says, I've yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. Howbeit, when he, the spirit of truth is come, he will guide you into all truth. There are many mysteries which I do not seek to understand or explain. They are too high for me and too high for you. On some of these points, silence is golden. We heard that in Dwight's um, study. Yes. Piety, devotion, sanctification of soul, body, and spirit. This is essential for us all. This is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God in Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. So that's so. these are both from 14 manuscript releases, the first from page 23, the other one from page 179. Okay, so... Yeah, so those are going to be, if people want to look those up. Okay, somebody else had a comment, and I interrupted them because I wanted to finish reading. It's all you explained it. Okay. Okay, thank you for that. Um, So, yeah, Mm -hmm. my my position is, yeah, there's an element where the Holy Spirit, you can't really, there's a mystery. There's some people who are either one one side or the other, Trinitarian, anti-Trinitarian, and they think they have things down to a T, <laughs> you know, and that they can explain things. And um, I think it's good just to consider what's there, but to have it, 
you know, um, yeah, so, so you can go to extremes on either end, I think, mm. if thinking you have God down to a T in that explanation. Okay, but thanks for that. So maybe the, the next paragraph, maybe you could read that, Theodore. Please. In great mercy, according to his divine character, God bore along with Lucifer. The spirit of discontent and disaffection had never before been known in heaven, and it was a new element, strange, mysterious, unaccountable. Lucifer himself had not at first been acquainted with the real nature of his feelings. For a time, he had feared to express the workings and imaginings of his mind, yet he did not dismiss them. He did not see whither he was drifting, but such efforts as infinite love and wisdom could only devise were made to convince him of his error. His disaffection was proved to be without cause, and he was made to see what would be the result of persisting, persisting in revolt. Lucifer was convinced that he was in the wrong. He saw that the Lord is righteous in all his ways and holy in all his works, that the divine statutes are just, and that he ought to acknowledge them as such before all heaven. Had he done this, he might have saved himself and many angels. He had not at that time fully cast off his allegiance to God. Though he had left his position as covering cherub, yet if he had been willing to return to God, acknowledging the creator's wisdom and satisfied to fill the place appointed him in God's great plan, he would have been reinstated in his office. The time had come for a final decision. He must fully yield to the divine sovereignty or place himself in open rebellion. He nearly reached the decision to return, but pride forbade him. It was too great a sacrifice for one who had been uh, so highly honored to confess that he had been in error, that his imaginings were false, and to yield to the authority which he had been working to prove unjust. So he had attained pride, but he couldn't confess wrong. Yes. Mm -hmm. So the next paragraph, a compassionate creator in yearning pity for Lucifer and his followers was seeking to draw them back from the abyss of ruin into which they were about to plunge, but his mercy was misinterpreted. Lucifer pointed to the long suffering of God as an evidence of his own superiority and the indication that the king of the universe would yet accede to his terms. If angels would stand firmly with him, he declared, they could yet gain all that they had, all that they desired. He persisted defending his course and fully committed himself to the great controversy against his maker. Thus, thus it was that Lucifer, the light bearer, the sharer of God's glory, the attendant of his throne, by transgression became Satan, the adversary of God, and holy beings, and the destroyer of those whom, he whom, whom heaven had committed to his guidance and guardianship. So uh, Satan sets his course, and uh, God's long suffering is seen as something which is an advantage that God can finally uh, uh, go with what Lucifer is saying but he's uh, deceived that way so loyal angels reason with angel uh, with Lucifer so angels that were loyal and true sought to reconcile this mighty rebellious angel to the will of his creator they justified the act of God in conferring honour upon Jesus Christ and with forcible Portable reasoning sought to convince Lucifer that no less honour was his now than before the father had claimed the honour which he had conferred upon his son. They clearly set forth that Jesus was the son of God, existing with him before the angels were created, and that he ever stood at the right hand of God, and his mild, loving authority had not hitherto been hitherto for being questioned, and that he had given no commands, but that but what but what it was joy for the heavenly host to execute. 
They urged that Christ, uh, receiving special honor from the Father in the presence of the angels, did not detract from the honor that he had hitherto received. The angels wept. They anxiously sought to, to move Satan to renounce his wicked design and yield submission to their creator. For all had hitherto been peace and harmony, and what could occasion this dissenting rebellious voice? So uh, angels can weep. There we have that information there as well. So um, maybe uh, someone volunteer to read the next one. Orga, how are we doing for time? Let me got about ten minutes. Okay. How many you got left? Oh well, no, no, we're never, never finish it. It's, it's, um, we'll just go and tell time. Oh. <laughs> you want to read for us, Amanda? Okay. Go? Please, thanks. Uh, Lucifer refused to reason, rejecting with disdain the arguments and entreats of the loyal angels. He denounced them as deluded slaves. The preference shown to Christ, he declared an act of injustice both to him and to all the heavenly host. These angels, true to God, stood in amazement as they saw that Lucifer was successfully in his effort to excite rebellion. He promised them a new and better government than they then had, in which all would be freedom. Great number signified their purpose to accept Lucifer as their leader and chief commander. As he saw his advances were met with success, he fretted himself that he should yet have all the angels on his side and that he would be equal with God himself. And his voice of authority would be heard in commanding the entire host of heaven. Again, the loyal angels warned Lucifer and assured him, what must be the consequence if he persisted that he he could create the angels, could by his power overturn all their authority and in some signal manner punish their audacity and treble rebellion. They warned the rebellious to close their, eye, their ears to Lucifer's deception, reasoning, and advise Lucifer and all who had been affected by him to go to God and confess their wrongs for even admitting a thought of questioning his authority. Okay, thank you. McDonald. So, you know, one of the things when we look here at this um, rebellion in heaven, I mean, we know the end that, you know, because it's talking here about basically they can be punished. And we know at the end that every knee but will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father, right? So we know that the fallen angels, Satan himself, will bow the knee. And acknowledge that God is just. So all of this history of humanity is, is an answer to this rebellion. Right? That's why the final generation and what they experience is necessary to remove rebellion forever from, from heaven. This issue of the great controversy, of course, is well understood by Seventh day Adventists, not generally understood by other Christians. And especially when they think that God is just, you know, arbitrarily choosing those that are going to be saved and those that are going to be lost. And then also uh, burning forever in hell, torturing people forever in hell. Uh, 
who never asked to be created in the first place as and somehow believing that this shows a just God. And you see, part of the reason why some of this rebellion exists is the ideas that Christians have about God. But here we see something quite clear. We see God's justice and mercy uh, brought together in this story. Yes, and uh, oh, another angel's playing a part as well, mm -hmm. seeking to uh, draw back Satan from the pit of ruin. Mm -hmm. uh, we can maybe just uh, read this last paragraph, and that would maybe do us. So with further deception, uh, Lucifer binds wavering angels to himself. Many of Lucifer's sympathizers were inclined to heed the counsel of the loyal angels and repent of their dissatisfaction and be again received to the confidence of the father and his dear son. But Lucifer had another deception ready. The mighty revolver now declared that the angels who had united with him had gone too far to return that he was acquainted with the divine law and knew that God would not forgive. He declared that all who should submit to the authority of heaven would be stripped of their honour, degraded from their position. For himself, he was determined never again to acknowledge the authority of Christ. The only course remaining for him and his followers, he said, was to assert their liberty and gain by force the rights which had not been willingly accorded them. So far as Satan himself was concerned, it was true that he now had gone too far to return, but not so with those who had been blinded by his deceptions. To them, the counsels and entreaties of the royal angels opened the door of hope, and they heeded the warning. Sorry, and yeah. sorry, and had they heeded the warning, they might have broken away from the snare of Satan. But pride, love for their leader and the desire for unrestricted freedom were permitted to bear sway, and the pleadings of divine love and mercy were finally rejected. And then we just get into that aspect where there's war in heaven. Uh, there was a, an animation produced by some Adventists, I think they're from Romania. And they oh, yeah. had this year, War in Heaven. They placed it after the cross. And oh. to me, I looked at all Ellen White's statements concerning, concerning this War in Heaven, and it's all kind of around this history. I can see why there's maybe some verses there even the context of Revelation 12, you have the man-child, the dragon, the man-child is taken to heaven. And then you have this, and there says there will be war in heaven. So you maybe think the context there is maybe around after Christ's ascension. Um, but Ellen White never refers to that war. So I think I wrote in one of my comments, and some people agreed with it, and then it was the comment, I don't see it anymore, it's been removed. <laughs> so <laughs> they didn't like it. Um, they seem to be quite so, no, you're wrong. Uh, the war in heaven happens after the the um, ascension and so forth. Now, because, now didn't, we, didn't we recently run into this problem somewhere? I'm trying to remember exactly. Something to do with Jeff's articles or something like that? I'm trying to remember. We had a discussion regarding this. So mm -hmm. one of the things that we see is, is the war in heaven is a continuing process. But, you know, uh, Jesus says, I saw Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Um, and he puts that in the context of when the disciples are, you know, casting out the demons and so forth. But we know this war in heaven happened first. But there is points in history that where they're symbolically – in again, right? Like at the cross, right? In connection with yes. with that. Um, but yeah, some people are trying to to say that you know that that war in heaven did happen at the cross, and it's not referring to uh, back at the beginning, which doesn't really make any sense. But um, I just can't remember what, why we had this discussion before. 
But anyway, it's almost all, it's almost all in it. And yes, and there is so like quotes. El might you know the progressive aspect of the battle that there was a significant event in that war in a sense with uh, at the cross. Yeah. And um, but it wasn't necessarily when the, the right. royal angels were cast out of heaven were, were cast out before the creation of the earth. You know. Yeah. And she just and, takes just takes those words and places them there. Because it's a continuation of that war. She's not saying that's when the war happened. Yes. So after because Christ was, yeah, after Christ was crucified, and you see all these here, this year animation, all these angels going up to heaven with swords and whatever, and then being cast out. <laughs> oh. Tell me. It's, yeah. yeah. But, yeah, anyway, but, I, but Revelation 12, you know, people just uh, do that. But anyway, thanks for the study, Stephen. That was uh, good. It fits in with what we've been studying. So how many more people do you have? Did you do like half of it or most of it? or um, Probably not even half, I'd say. Okay, so you're doing this next week again? Yeah, probably about a quarter. Okay, so, so you're going to be doing it for a little bit. Uh, I can do it next week if you want. I have, I have some friends staying with me, but uh, they can join in their Adventists. So. Okay, so you can do it next week? Yes. Okay, Okay. so you'll be doing it next week, continuing. So I'll label it as part one. Yes. What's the title? Uh, the great, the beginning of the great controversy, according to Ellen White. Okay, okay. Well, can, can you close with prayer? Yes, uh-huh. let's pray. Dear loving Heavenly Father, uh, we give thanks for this year's study. We pray it be a blessing to those who have attended and to those who would watch online as uh, we get further insights into what transpired in the past and how you dealt with um, the angels who rebelled. And we give thanks for your mercy and love that is extended to us. And uh, we seek to be like the loyal angels uh, to say that your counsel, uh, you're worthy of honor, that the Christ is worthy of exaltation. And uh, we uh, humble ourselves and seek to do your will and to honor you in all that we do and say. And we ask your blessings upon us as we enter a new week after the Sabbath. And um, hope us bring us back again next week to... Uh, continue these studies and be with us uh, during the studies uh, concerning Daniel 11 gives us, give us greater insights as to uh, understanding uh, that chapter. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.